Join us now for Education Matters, a weekly look at the real people and real stories in education across North Carolina. Welcome to Education Matters, presented by the Public School Forum of North Carolina. I'm Keith Poston. Last year, the average pay for a principal in North Carolina ranked 50th nationally. The General Assembly responded with new investments and a new plan for how principals are paid. That plan has drawn a lot of criticism because if unchanged, it will result in big pay cuts for many experienced principals and perhaps create a disincentive for talented principals to help turn around struggling schools. This week, we're joined by two former principals of the year and a district superintendent to discuss. Before we tackle our main topic, we open with headlines, a quick scan of education headlines across North Carolina and the U.S. The legislative session of the General Assembly kicked off last week. This year is the so-called short session, where only budget bills affecting last year's two-year budget are considered, as well as any bill that passed one chamber or the other. Of course, history has shown these rules are not always hard and fast. House and Senate leaders say they have already agreed on the actual budget, and they figure to aim to complete their work quickly. With every House and Senate member facing a challenger in November, there's a big incentive to expedite adjournment so they can hit the fundraising and campaign trail. One of the first education bills introduced following the teacher march and rally last week would require every school in the state to post in God we trust signs in a prominent place in the school. The bill introduced by Republican House members would also require the display of U.S. and North Carolina flags in each classroom and the recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance every day. Now clearly the biggest headline last week was the teacher march and rally that I just mentioned. That rally drew more than 20,000 teachers from across the state to Raleigh to push for more support for public schools. Educa Education Matters was there with our camera and we talked to teachers about why they marched. Take a look. What do you hope um, to accomplish? What do you hope that this, that this gathering does? Well, number one, I hope that it gives our teachers an opportunity to have their voices heard. As I've traveled the state, one of the recurring themes has been, I, I feel almost invisible. I don't feel like they see what we're doing and what our struggles are, and, and I just don't know how to help them understand. I want teachers to get their stories out there. We each have an individual story about our school, about our students, about our community. And each of those stories is, is a collective responsibility of all the people that are involved. We're here with Mark Jewell, president of North Carolina Association of Educators, NCAE, who organized today's rally. Well, first of all, did you expect this kind of turnout? We were thinking about a thousand, you know, <laughs> and uh, then obviously we saw school districts working with their school boards and administration to actually close the school system so they could take personal days. Uh, we're 39th in the nation, we're the ninth largest system in the country, and we're 39th in teacher pay, $9,000 below the national average. Our students deserve better than that. So I want all the students in public schools to have a fair education. It's seeing the children suffer day after day, year after year, because I've been doing it 20 years and I know where we started, I know how it used to be. Children don't have materials to take home, the teachers are supplying more and more. My son is 16 years old and my textbooks are older than him. When we see our pay, when we see uh, the disparities in education, it's disheartening. What do you want our elected officials to hear? Um, that our kids need more, our teachers need more. We're asked to make future leaders and doctors and lawyers and scientists with a penny and a pat on the back. They've taken the creativity and the autonomy out of teaching. We recently had a school that had to close. They had a termite infestation across the floor in the library and they had to, they had to completely redo that. So that school went without a library until that floor was redone. So, and there's no money to do that. The reason that we took a day off, some of us had to take a personal day, pay $50 out of our pocket to be here, pay to be here, drive here, three hours is what I drove. Some of my other educators were driving for five hours. But we're not here to take a day off. 
We're here to support our students and make sure that the General Assembly raises per pupil spending. We're not asking for a lot. North Carolina is a dominant force in education. We have kids coming from all over the world. We need more bilingual type classes for our teachers. We have a lot of ESL students in our schools and just meeting the needs of being able to communicate to keep that barrier open to make all our students feel involved and feel important. The kids just need more. You know, I like the money, but <laughs> it's not about the money. I didn't go into education for the money. I went in it for the kids. And they're falling apart and they need so much more support. Over and over again, all I kept hearing was, I want to help my students. And that's why they came to Raleigh today. It's been a, uh, already been an unprecedented day for North Carolina and for education. It'll be interested to see what happens in this legislative session. It was indeed quite a scene. Uh, the real question, of course, remains, will it make a difference? We'll definitely be watching. As I said at the top of the show, average principal pay in North Carolina had dropped to an embarrassing 50th nationally a year ago. The General Assembly responded, but not everyone believes we're on the right track. So joining us first to talk about it is Dr. Stephen Ganey. Dr. Ganey is the superintendent of Randolph County School System. Uh, Dr. Ganey, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. You obviously, you're, you've got 31 schools in Randolph County, so you've, you've got 31 principals you've got to, uh, uh, to hire, retain, keep, support. The changes to, that were made to the principal pay plan last year, and I, I mean, we've talked about it on the show before, but really the biggest changes were we, it, it, they took away, uh, you know, experience doesn't, doesn't you know, factor into it now, it doesn't factor into advanced degrees, and really tied it to test score growth in a lot of ways, uh, you know, growth uh, in academic performance over time. What are your thoughts about just that approach? Well, I want to start by saying I appreciate that we're having this conversation. As I told my principals in the past 12, 15 months, I'm excited that this is a topic we're discussing because I think there's just tremendous value on having great principals leading schools. Uh, I have several concerns. Uh, I have concerns about when you start having a salary schedule where uh, principal's salary can go up or down from year to year, what are you going to accomplish in the schools over the long haul? Because I talk to our principals a lot about building positive school cultures, and you can't build those overnight. And, um, and so if a, a school's academic growth goes up and you don't have a positive school culture to go with it that takes multiple years to build, there's a chance it can go right back, where it, it can fall right back. Right. So. Um, very concerned about the volatility of the of the salary schedule, but I want to go back to my first statement. I appreciate that this conversation is such a hot conversation in North Carolina because we need to be having this conversation about leaders of schools. Well, and, and let's talk about that. You mentioned culture. I mean, when you think when you're looking for a, a new principal or potentially elevating someone, is that when you look at them? Are you looking at someone? Um, who you think can drive a culture or maintain it. Is that really, is, is that a big part of it? Because I, I know having a daughter in schools myself, you could, you could tell, I mean, a school really had a culture. Was it a place where learning happened, where teachers felt supported and they worked with each other or not, right? Well, I think it all works together. And that's why I, you know, I've been doing this 25 years now and I've watched schools, if they don't have that positive culture, then the academic improvement that might take place does not continue on over years. So when I'm talking to principals or principal candidates, I'm looking for that principal who, A, is comfortable with who they are and I feel like can build relationships with the staff and the students and the parents and the community because that is as important as the academic growth because quite frankly, that's gonna be one of the big factors to sustain the academic growth and you can't build that in one year. Right, under the, current, under the new principal pay plan that was uh, passed last year, it's estimated about one in five principals in North Carolina will actually lose pay, not just not get a raise, but actually see a cut in pay later this year unless something has changed. Are you concerned about losing veteran principals because of that? Very concerned. And, and you know, um, I've worked in three school systems in state, and, and um, I love Randolph County School System. It's, it's the best job I've had. I love the people in Randolph County School System, but I also love the state of North Carolina. I'm a product of the public schools in North Carolina, and I don't want to see us lose principals in the Randolph County school system. I also don't want to see the state of North Carolina lose principals. And I'm, I worry that 
with this volatility up, up and down of this salary schedule, are we going to put principals in a position that they may be thinking, well, I have enough years to retire. I really wanted to go on further. I still love what I'm doing, but maybe, maybe I need to go ahead and, and step out. And that'll be, that could be a, a big blow to the state of North Carolina. It could be a big blow to the Randolph County school system. And not all of our viewers know this, but you can quickly explain on the pension. You were a principal, you're a superintendent. So when, when you retire, I mean, say so you get your 25, 30 years in, what is your pension based on? The highest four consecutive school Highest years. four consecutive. So if it goes down in those last few years, it could have an impact it could affect, going forward. It could affect what, what um, window of service you're looking at. Right. So what do you, how do you evaluate a principal and what do you think if you were, you know, if you could just design something, how would you want to um, um, sort of compensate a principal? Well, academic performance has to be there, so there's no question that piece needs to stay. I would, if we could do a compensation schedule, I would like to see something there with um, years of service, uh, additional degrees, uh, the advanced degrees. I think that needs to be there because there is tremendous learning when, when principals are pursuing advanced degrees, when teachers are pursuing advanced degrees. There is tremendous learning. That is, they're learning and that does come back and impact schools in a positive way. And so I'd like to see those two factors return. I also like the, uh, uh, there's things about the salary schedule I like. I like that we're talking about school size. I like that. And I would like that to be factored in. I have a concern that the current yeah, we schedule. Mentioned, you, you asked them, you mentioned, tell me about that, the, the idea well, of, us, of what size school it is. Well, most of my schools, uh, my, my high schools are, we have one 3A and, and uh, the other ones are 2A, and then we have early college for 400 students. So we don't have the high schools that are just the huge ones, but I was the principal of a high school that went from 25 to 2,600 students the five years, four and a half years I was there as principal. And, and um, you know, that's a big difference when the salary schedule cuts off at 1,300. Right. Um, so I, I think there needs to be some recognition for some other size schools. Right. So one of the things, there is a new bill that was introduced last week, Senate Bill 718. Um, we don't know if that's going to pass or not, but it's, uh, it does extend the hold harmless provision, basically the no principal will lose pay this upcoming school year. Uh, and then there's another provision in it that would extend if a, if a high performing principal goes to a challenging school environment, low performing school, there's a three year hold harmless. Uh, I guess what are your thoughts? Do you think that's, a, is that enough? Well, I, the, I like the idea of protecting the principal who you may ask to go to another school and, and try to get it moving. I, I like that idea and, and I appreciate that. And I, you know, I talked with Mr. Tillman, I know he put forth right. that bill and, and he's one of our legislators and very always very easy for yes. me to talk to, but I'm, I'm very concerned about the piece of, we had held harmless for 1718, principals couldn't make less than they were making in 1617. So I'm a little concerned about why now it's fine for, I'm concerned about them possibly making less than 1819 compared to 1718. Right. And we have a precedent for that when we did the ABC program. And there was principals earned bonuses and they stayed in their salary and moved with them. So that concerns me, okay. it does. Well, there's some, there'll be some more work done, done on it for sure. We're gonna to talk to two principals next and get their take on it. But Dr. Ganey, I appreciate you coming in and talking to us. Thank you. So when we come back, you're gonna hear from two award-winning principals. Welcome back. We're going to continue our discussion about principal pay with two principals who actually happen to be both former North Carolina Principals of the Year. We have Dr. Carrie Tolbert. Carrie is the principal of Concord Middle School in Cabarrus County. And we have Melody Chalmers. Melody is the principal in my hometown, E.E. E. Smith High School in Cumberland County. So welcome, both of you. Um, we just talked to Dr. Ganey about, uh, you know, as a superintendent, you know, he's looking for superstar principals like you two, and so I guess I want to get your take on, you know, the, some of the changes that happened with the principal pay. I guess the, two of the biggest things that changed was the, uh, the General Assembly eliminated um, uh, pay for advanced degrees, and they eliminated um, uh, pay for based on experience. Well, I'm going to start with you, Dr. Tolbert. Uh, um, obviously, that would affect you, and, but I guess overall, sort of, 
Do you think that uh, advanced degrees and years of experience matter in terms of comp or should matter in terms of compensation? Absolutely. It is an investment in yourself as an educator and trying to be a lifelong learner and lead by example with your staff. And um, it has made me a better educator, no doubt, investing in my own education. Um, and so it's kind of a slap in the face that I'm no longer paid for that and, and kind of confusing that assistant principals are still paid for advanced degrees, but principals are not paid for advanced mm -hmm. degrees, yet the responsibility of a principal is um, far heavier than an assistant principal. And the same thing with years of experience. I know a lot more than I did now um, as eight years in versus my first year as a principal. Experience matters, and all the research shows that, is that the longer you do it, the um, just the more you learn. Um, it's just very powerful how experience makes you a better educator. Right, no, that, that is, I mean, it is a bit confusing to me as well. I mean, I'd like to think that, I mean, as a manager and as an employee, I'm, I'm better than I was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Experience matters a lot, right? It absolutely does. You know, I'm privileged to be the principal at East Smith High School in Cumberland County. And, you know, we have we face some challenges that other schools don't face. And as a principal coming in, being there now seven years, I've learned so much about what it takes to build culture, build relationships, and be an effective leader. And so it, it would be, it's very beneficial, I believe, to pay principals for that experience that they've gained um, through working in a school and, and demonstrating success. Right. Now, uh, Dr. Talbert, one of the things that has been a focus, and I think, I mean, a stated goal by the legislature is we want to have our best principals, our most effective, um, our high flyers, going to schools that are low performing. I mean, to help turn around, turn around schools. Mm -hmm. You, I mean, Concord Middle School was is, is, is a school that you joined when? Three years Three ago. Three years ago. And it was a school that, that it was mm -hmm. having some challenges yes. academically. So the whole idea of a hold harmless for a year mm -hmm. or a couple of years, is that, how long does it take um, to turn around a school? <laughs> I Do mean, we know? <laughs> Melanie and I both get talked about that. Um, I think one of the biggest issues in low performing schools is turnaround with administration and teachers. Um, constant turnover is very challenging for a school. I would never want to work for um, four different bosses in five years, and that's essentially what happened with our staff at Concord Middle okay. School. And so um, to recruit um, principals that are have a, a record of you know, success sure. um, is very important to low-performing schools, but then you also have the legislation around low-performing schools that doesn't really attract principals to low-performing schools because there is the a eight, timeline. You're talking about the A to F school grading yes, system? Yes. And, uh, and, um, and there's okay. also the timeline that is attached to a principal that you are supposed to show certain gains in academic achievement within a small time. Um, two years is what the um, legislation states and that so you have two years apparently to show growth um, at your school as a low-performing low school or there are certain actions or consequences that can happen to that principal. So how are you going to recruit a great principal to a school and then also have this other legislation around low-performing schools and also you know it takes three to five years to really impact a school. Mm -hmm. And principals don't stick around that long anymore for many reasons but one of them is the pay is not um, really matching what the needs and the demands of the job are, especially in a low-performing school. So you've got to have that consistency and high expectations for a long time. Now, Melody, when I talk to principals, uh, when I talk to teachers, um, they all tell me we're, we're, not, we're not afraid of being judged based on performance. Um, um, but, they're, but they're sometimes skeptical or, or again, don't like the, the, the model. Um, so we've already talked about the idea of advanced degrees. I mean, obviously, you, you, would, you would agree with that, I think, and also that experience matters. But what do you think, um, as a principal, what, would you, what do you think a good principal should be judged on? Well, I absolutely believe the focus is on academic results for students. That is the bottom line for us um, at our school and in our, in our county. Uh, but I think that the community needs to understand that there's a lot more that goes into a school other than, or, or to assess a school other than a test score. And what I can say is that E. Smith High School, we have met or exceeded growth during the seven years that I've been there. That took a lot of partnerships with parents, with our community with building relationships, strong PLCs. So there's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes. And so I would like to see the, the principal pay plan focus on increasing the base pay for all of that work that goes in. And that we should still uh, have incentives 
for meeting growth and exceeding growth because I absolutely believe that right. that is important. But I think more focus needs to be put back into increasing base pay. So to get the, the increase the base pay, which of course would get to the idea of this average pay being so low. Um, but the, it sounds like to me you're talking about that incentives um, really um, it would be something that would be uh, appealing to you because I mean that, you, you're like I don't think you're gonna you're, you're obviously your focus is on your students but uh, man people like the idea of like, people want to be rewarded for their performance they do a good job and I happen to be principal at a school I graduated from so I tell people all the time I want the school to be the best right. always I want the best for my students um, but we have to understand that there are challenges with the teacher shortage. Um, students come with mental health issues and other concerns that can make it challenging sometimes. So we just say increase the base pay and, and still provide incentives for principals for meeting and exceeding growth. Is the job getting harder? Oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> Every day. And I think, again, the base pay, what Melody was talking about, is so important. When 44% of the principals in the state of North Carolina are paid on teacher salary because the principal base pay is not enough, that's, that's heartbreaking. How many? What's the percent? 44%, 44%. Of principals are paid on the, the teacher pay because it's yes. so low as a yes. principal. Yes. Yeah, there's something wrong. Terrible. And so how are you going to recruit even assistant principals to go into the principalship? Now, I have outstanding assistant principals at Concord Middle School, but they have no desire right now to go into the principalship because why? It's more responsibility, but the pay barely increases for them. And they too are also getting paid on the teacher salary. So there's just, wh why would you do it when you have no difference in pay? In right, and, I've, yeah, and we've also seen, you mentioned the assistant pay, uh, the mm -hmm. assistant principal pay schedule. We have principals that are also opting, that are being paid on the, on the AP program. schedule mm -hmm. because of the advanced degrees and other yes, things. Yes, so. yes. And that's great that mm -hmm. school systems are allowing some of those freedoms. But again, what does that really say to what you want to recruit the best. Well, yeah, and, you're best. Not, and that's not exactly, then you're not really, it's not It's not really a system anymore. You're not really a pay, you're just kind of right. moving it around to try to make it fit. Right. So right. Um, what about, you know, as far as the sort of how things have changed, you know, one thing that uh, when we talk to teachers is the, the children are coming in with so many more issues and challenges. Absolutely, and, and I think that when you pay a principal just based off of an outcome, it doesn't take into effect all of the inputs and all the work that goes into making sure a school is successful. As I stated at East Smith High School, we've exceeded or met growth each year, and each year that we are working harder and harder. The, ta the task has just gotten a lot more daunting because of the societal issues that many of our right. students bring into our school buildings. But you know, we're committed as leaders to be successful, and we're thankful, um, as Dr. Ganey said, that, that the legislator is putting consideration and, into and this. That, and just a very last word of mm -hmm. quickly, the, um, and you mentioned that once you get to a certain point of achieving growth there in, in the current thing, really at that point it's just a risk of going down. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And, that's, and that truly is our concern. Right, mm -hmm. right. Well, look, thank you both for what you do for our schools and for our students, and thanks for being here on the show. Thanks okay. so much. Sure. Thank you. After the break, this week's final word. A year ago, it seemed everyone agreed that the state needed to do something on principal pay. After all, we had fallen to 50th nationally in average principal pay, and school superintendents were concerned about their ability to recruit and retain the best school leaders. To the General Assembly's credit, they did respond with $25 million in new investment for principal pay raises. Critics, however, and you heard about some of that today, said it wasn't enough, and worse, that the new plan would not only result in pay cuts, for up to one in five principals across the state, it may actually lock in a disincentive for principals to move to chronically low performing, typically high poverty schools because of the plan's reliance on standardized test scores. A new bill has been introduced this session to address some of the concerns, but the fundamental aspects of the plan, tying a principal's pay to improving test scores and academic scores would remain. We already know how critical having a good principal is to the school. It's the single biggest factor for a teacher in deciding whether to stay at a school or in teaching for that matter. Given that test scores and much more are so much more aligned with student poverty than they are to the quality of the principal, does it really make sense to create a disincentive for our very best principals like these two here today to take on the challenge of a low performing high poverty school? Incentives, yes, absolutely. But if our principals are underpaid already, why would we create for principals the ability to lose pay? Isn't their job already hard enough? 
Next week, we're going to talk about our state school building and infrastructure needs and a school bond bill being considered at the General Assembly. We're actually going to take a field trip to Rockingham County, so make sure you tune in next week and learn more about our needs all across the state. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you then.